Hi right, guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 384. And I know I told you guys I was going to do a, a review this episode, but uh, I've decided to do a change of plans and uh, because I got Mark Baldwin on uh, for this week. Now, he, there's a Kickstarter project running right now called Empire Deluxe Combined, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And the guy who's running that, Mark Kincaid, was kind enough uh, to put me in touch with Mark Baldwin, who actually designed Empire as well as the Perfect General and uh, lots of other games. Uh, and he's just a fascinating guy all around, as you'll see in this episode. Uh, in this episode, we talk a little bit about uh, board games and the uh, what computer game designers can learn from those. Uh, that actually comes up at the end of the interview, uh, because we spend the, uh, the first bit talking about all this other stuff that Mark's done, including uh, work with drones, ICBMs. Uh, we talk about the uh, space shuttle program. He actually was the guy that <laughs> uh, freaking got the space shuttles into orbit. He, he planned, did all the planning for that, so just a lot of great stuff. I know you guys will really, really enjoy it. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, here is Mr. Mark Lewis Baldwin. All right, folks, so I am here with Mark Baldwin. He's the designer and former president of White Wolf Productions out of Colorado. He's authored and worked on many games, including Empire, uh, the Starfleet 1 and 2, the Perfect General, and many other games. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing great. I wanted to start by asking you what you think about this uh, this this Kickstarter that's actually running as we speak, the Killer Bees Empire Deluxe Combined Edition. Uh, that's on Kickstarter at I think a five thousand dollar pledge goal, but they're already getting pretty close to fifteen thousand on that. So obviously, there's a lot of interest in this uh, in this game. Uh, what are your thoughts on this Kickstarter? Are you excited about it? I don't know about excited about it. Um, I like seeing some of my work still continuing after so much time or whatever. It's kind of nice on the ego. Um, I mean, I, I liked playing Empire a lot when I used to play it. I don't have Killer Bee's current version. I'm going to have to pick it up sometime. But uh, it looks like he's done a lot of nice stuff to the game and keeps adding to it, keeps making it better, which I like seeing. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I really hear what you're saying there about the, the ego bit, but, you know, I talked to a lot of developers and designers who did some great games, and there's people like me that remember those games, but nobody's really playing them anymore, right? Uh, but I saw some comments about Empire where people are saying, no, we still play this uh, because the gameplay is so good. It doesn't matter about the graphics being outdated. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the gameplay is what was made it fun even back then, right? So would you agree with that? Yeah. And I hear it all the time, too. Uh, basically, I run into a fan here, fan there. Just say, I did Empire, and they go, their eyes glow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do these uh, guys and gals uh, have anything in common? Is there sort of a profile of an Empire fan? Uh, nerdish. <laughs> but then again, I'm nerdish, so what's the... <laughs> well, before we jump into all the Empire stuff, I was, uh, I really was... You sent me a link to some of your photographs that you've taken with, with drones. And I don't know really what I was expecting, but I was uh, really... I thought these were just spectacular photos. I mean, you probably want to... You, you probably have some of these framed up in your house somewhere, right? Just these uh, beautiful uh, skyscapes, I guess you'd call it, and the uh, ones in the mountains and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's amazing. But you, I noticed there was a note on the website about the FAA uh, shutting this down. <laughs> Do they, don't they know who you are? Well, with drones, the FAA basically discerns the difference between amateur flight and professional flight. Uh, and they define professional if you're doing anything for money. So if my mm -hmm. photography was sold, I become professional, I'm under a whole new set of flight rules and constraints. Uh, that I do not have uh, flying as an amateur. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I don't sell my stuff. I just do it for the art or whatever. You know, that's why we're on the topic, because you seem like a guy who would have a lot of background in this, being in the Air Force and the you know, <laughs> space shuttle program and all this. I mean, what are your thoughts? Uh, totally not related to games, but I don't care. <laughs> I mean, what are your thoughts on these this, this drone movement? I mean, is this the future... Uh, what what do you think? Uh, where we're going at? 
Well, the, the drone's a useful tool in all sorts of different ways. I'm using basically drones as a camera. It gives me different angles, gives me different photography and videography than is available prior to drones or whatever. And you can just look at my photos and there is a great deal of value, interest, uniqueness to those kinds of shots. So that's what I'm looking at a drone as, as a camera platform, plus fun, flying it around. Um, yeah, some of the angles just, you can get with those drones. I guess if you didn't have a drone, I guess you'd have to either build some kind of giant ladder scaffolding type thing or take a helicopter or plane right. up, right? Um, so it makes photography much more accessible to a lot more people or aerial photography. But that's only one small thing that uh, drones can't can accomplish as a tool for anything from farmer to farming to mining to everything else. It just brought down the cost massively because prior to that, you had to use helicopters or airplanes and so on, which is a very expensive process. And so you've cut the cost of doing a lot of these things by 100 to 1, which opens up whole new industries, whole new uh, ways at being more efficient at doing business in all sorts of ways. And you hear things also about Amazon and delivery services and so on. That one, I don't know if it'll ever pan out that well or not. Um, under certain circumstances, yes, but... Uh, your energy to weight ratio is fairly high for a drone and will always be that way because it's just lifting itself as well as trying to transport itself. And therefore, there, there's unique value, get it there fast, but it's not an overwhelming value as compared to doing things like uh, taking, get, taking your drone out to your farm and looking over your fields and so on on a weekly basis that's a powerful tool. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me. I guess airplanes themselves, when I guess were initially just used uh, kind of for photographs or surveillance, right, aerial surveillance. And it was a while before they were able to carry, I guess, weapons and bombs and <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or carry, you know, big cargoes and everything. Uh, yeah, I just I, my dream is to be able to call up a drone taxi service, you know, have it land in my yard, just climb at it and then be flown out the, you know, wherever I want to well, go. Well, we may see that someday, too. I haven't looked at the engineering analysis of those things, whether they're where they are on the practicality scale. Well, I was uh, looking at some of your biographies. Uh, they're kind of all over the place. And uh, One of the questions that comes up a lot is, you know, where exactly are you from? You know, I saw some reports that you might actually be an alien. Well, I've heard rumors to that, too, and I can't <laughs> comment on my alienness or not. Uh, but an alternate history would be that I grew up a military brat. Uh, my father was in the Air Force. Uh, family is originally from in Indiana. Um, I was born in Michigan. I lived in a couple places in Georgia. I lived in Florida. I lived in Germany for three years. I lived in Japan for three years. Uh, went to college in Indiana, and let's see, I was Air Force even for four years um, at Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, spent another six, eight years at Johnson Space Center working on the space shuttle, and I finally ended up in Colorado in the late 80s, and I've been in Colorado ever since with a couple of exceptions. I was down in Texas for a year, and I was in um, New Zealand for a year. But otherwise, I've always been here in Colorado. You ever miss that sort of military lifestyle? Military lifestyle did, well, the travel I enjoyed a great deal growing up. I think it uh, broadened me a great deal. Um, my personality didn't work that well with the military lifestyle. So I stayed in my four years because the Air Force paid for my college. And... Um, after I did the four years, I got out and did more fun stuff because I was working on ICBMs and I'd rather work on something which was positive for the human race, which would oh, be sure. a space shuttle than working on an ICBM. 
So uh, I moved up in the world when I left the Air Force. Yeah, I've often wondered how it would feel being in, in a program like that. So it seemed like you kind of had some values that clashed, I guess, with the yeah the assignments you were working on. or mm -hmm. So it wasn't just that you were rebellious or <laughs> didn't like authority. Well, or, there's a rebellion. All that kind of. Probably. I yeah. mean, um, I was used to the military environment having grown up in it, but still it wasn't a good fit for me. Yeah. But do you think that this experience, uh, you know, found, found its way into your uh, strategy games? I mean, it, well, I've how always profound is that influence? Military history so and strategy games. So where that came from, maybe part of the military environment I was in, uh, maybe my own nerdiness, I don't know. <laughs> um, it probably influenced me a little in deciding to go ROTC in college. Um, staying now in Vietnam was probably another influence for me going to ROTC in college. But uh, I found the four years in the Air Force was actually um, a great start to life as a adult or whatever because I was I had some real rough edges hmm. uh, going out of college, and the military maybe smoothed out some of those and gave me a little bit more confidence that I wouldn't have achieved this quickly in other venues. So it was good for me whether I liked it or not. What kind of work did you do on the space shuttle? I was a um, couple things, but the primary thing was I was in charge of flight design for uh, space shuttle missions from uh, liftoff to orbit. I think that sounds uh, pretty damn important. <laughs> <laughs> So you're like a very key member of this team. Well, I, I think I was, yeah. So I was, um, I mean, I led the team which uh, developed all the, all the missions, getting the vehicle up to orbit. Once you got into orbit, you handed it off to another team or whatever. And then once the vehicle started, started for reentry, that was handed on to another team. So you had basically three main teams designing the flight of the shuttle, getting it up there, what it's going to do up there, and then getting it back down. Were you a fan of the shuttle program? I'm not sure fan would be a good description. I I thought it was important. Mm -hmm. I just um, I just ask, and I hear different views on you know the what's what what should we be doing in terms of getting in you know exploring space and all this kind of stuff. You know, do you, do you like the direction that we're at now with the, I guess, these uh, rovers and things are sending out to Mars? Well, I, I think it needs to be a mix of a lot of different things. There does need to be man flying. Right. But robots can do so much, certain things so much better. So you use men where it's the best advantage and you use robots where it's the best advantage. Well, as long as I get to go to Mars before I die, that's <laughs> that I would consider a success. Okay, well, let's uh, move into games then. Uh, you'd said that I should ask you about game design before I even brought up computer game design. So uh, <laughs> go ahead and do that then. So uh, what about, I guess you're talking about board games and tabletop games, right? Well, I was a game designer before I was a computer game designer. Um, I think my first published game was at age 14, something like that, which was a rule set, which was based on, I had developed the game, Mainture's game, but played on the floor, um, Space Warfare, um, based on E.E. E. Doc Smith's Linsman series. And I had that published about age 14, 15. And I had played around with game design and so on ever since. I was a board gamer uh, long before I played computer games or whatever. And I still have a closet full of board games. You said you did that when you were 15? Well, the, uh, the Lensman game came out when I was 14. And that was basically was a little more than a set of mimeographed rule sets. Mm -hmm. But I think I sold two, three hundred of them or something wow. like that. <laughs> so nobody was uh, looking down on you for being so young doing the, these kind of things, right? Or did they nah. even know? Like, they probably didn't even know. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, that's still impressive, and I, I, I guess it's pretty clear when you play uh, Empire, you can definitely see some board game uh, influences there. I mean, how tight of a relation do you think it's more maybe in the strategy genre this this uh, link to board games and maybe in some other genres? Oh, definitely yes. Um, one of the things, let's see, I'm I'm going to divert a little here because we're I'm going into my teacher mode here. Uh, <laughs> I teach game design classes. I've found a large dichotomy of those who play board games versus those who just grew up with computer games as far as the skills necessary for game design. And the reason for this is with board games, the mechanism of the gameplay is obvious to the game player and the game designer and is very specific to the game player and the game designer. In other words, every rule is there in the book. You have to, re or the rule pages or whatever. And as a designer, you have to make each one of those rules work with what e every other rule such that the sum of the rules provide the entertainment. And you're, these are pieces you're working with, de detail. And the game player sees this as well, because the game player has to understand the rules. When we moved on in the computer games, though, the, get, the computer manages the game rules. Therefore, the game player who has played games for years or whatever is, has had the game rules, the pieces that combine together to create the full entertainment hidden from them. Therefore, they don't have the, many times, they don't have the detailed understanding of how the game mechanics exist and how they have to work with each other in a ga good game design to create good game play. And therefore, when I'm teaching my students, I find it more difficult with those who've only been playing computer games. So that was off to a side um, thesis of mine or whatever. That's a, a fascinating insight. I don't think I've ever heard that expressed uh, before, but it makes a lot of sense the more I think about it. So with the board game, part of it is always, well, how do we play this? We've got to read the rules. And you kind of, at least when we, <laughs> my wife and friends and family uh, come over, we always have that sort of, you know, everybody's got to learn these rules and you play it a few times and you're like, well, can you do that? Well, I don't know. We have to look it up, and pretty soon you get to the point where even if the rule's not there, you sort of have enough of a feel for how the game works, right? To say even if that rule's not specified, I think it should be you know, this. You know what? You sort of get to that that point of it. Uh, whereas, yeah, I think maybe somebody that had just played computer games, and you know, if it doesn't work, you just can't do it, right? And uh, the game just won't let you do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so so yeah, that's uh, obvious. It almost and, seems like the people might be stunted that only played the uh, <laughs> the video I games. I would be stunted, but <laughs> that's the idea. Now, here's the other side of it, though. The rules are even more important on a computer game because you just mentioned that if the rule doesn't exist, you can get the pattern from the rules which do exist to uh, create a new rule to fill the hole. Right. In a computer game... Since the computer manages all the rules, you have do not have that ability. The designer of the computer game has to make sure every single hole of the rules is complete. The mechanics are full and complete, where in a paper game, that wasn't necessarily true in the design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes think about that when you hear about it. Uh, people that use the the ex they exploit the rules in a computer game somehow type in negative numbers and so on and uh, they think that's clever but of course in a board game situation the other players would just say no <laughs> we're not going to allow that yeah it's just a different I guess a whole different way of uh, experiencing games I'm starting to feel sorry for the people that haven't played more board games <laughs> that's probably proud of your curriculum right maybe you have some uh, classic board games you make everybody play. I wish I had time to, yes, but I don't. <laughs> the best I can do is I introduce them to diplomacy oh. because diplomacy has very complex gameplay with very simple set of rules. So um, 
that complexity, our simplicity, I can stress with the um, board game diplomacy. Mm-hmm. I think you also, I saw Panzer Leader somewhere on <laughs> one of these sites. I assume you're familiar with that one. Yeah, but I haven't touched that for 40 years or something. <laughs> uh, diplomacy is the one to play, okay. Well, that's the one that fits into my curriculum of um, pushing this idea of rules and how rules work together to create something greater than, than the sum. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, hopefully be back next week, but uh, considering that classes are be in session uh, next uh, week, the first week of classes here at St. Cloud State, I'm not making any promises. I could easily get overwhelmed uh, with preparing for that. Uh, so if you don't see me for a while, you know where I am. Uh, no reason to panic. I'll try to get this uh, part two up. It's only a two-parter. I'll hopefully get that second part up as soon as possible. As always, though, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of this show, guys. You're keeping interviews, these interviews coming. We, you, you know, would you hear about Mark Baldwin? Get to, get to hear all these stories if it weren't for Matt Chap. You know, ponder that and ponder whether you think the show is worth supporting, worth a buck. Uh, these episodes in production, uh, a lot of you guys have already, and I thank you very much for that. But if you haven't done that, all you have to do is just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site, become a Ratreon of uh, Matt Chat. All I ask is one buck per episode, about four bucks, uh, you know, a month tops. So uh, anyway, if, you, if you've done that already, thanks. Uh, if you're considering it for whatever reason, you can't quite make up your mind, uh, just <laughs> trust me, it's easy and you will enjoy the show that much more, knowing that you help make it possible. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, quite a bit of news here. Uh, one for all you uh, Cleve, uh, Cleve uh, fans. Uh, Cleve himself has actually agreed to, to uh, be a guest on Matt Chat. <laughs> Barely talk. Uh, he's also said that I will be the only person he allows to interview him. Uh, so that's quite an honor. Really looking forward to having him on. Uh, we haven't set up any dates yet. He's, he wants to, you know, give Grimwire a chance to catch on uh, by itself. Uh, so <laughs> nobody can say it was just because of endorsements or whatever. So. Uh, anyway, I'm really looking forward to that. I'll keep you posted. Also, hopefully we'll get to uh, review that game, a Grimwire course, uh, pretty soon after this uh, Mark Baldwin series. Uh, I do want to make sure I have enough time, though, to you know to put a proper number of hours into it so it's not just kind of a slapdash thing, but actually an in-depth uh, review uh, that you know does the game justice. It took like 20 years to make the game. You don't want to review it in 20 minutes, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, in other news, uh, Ed Greenwood, uh, the creator of the Forgotten Realms D&D campaign, you probably heard of that one, uh, he's going to be on Adam's show, Adam Dayton, friend of the show, uh, his podcast called Moonhawk Studios Presents, that's at msp.starshipmoonhawk.com. Now, Ed's going to be on tomorrow at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. I know I'm not giving you guys a lot of headway with this, but they archive the show so you can catch it later. If you happen to catch it in time, though, you can actually uh, propose some questions, maybe even uh, call in during the show. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, anyway, uh, there'll be a link to that in the show notes. Very exciting. Uh, congratulations, uh, Adam. That's awesome. Uh, Stig wrote in about a couple of things. Uh, first is that Minsk and Boo are back, and they're back in the form of a graphic novel. I think it's the second one of these they've done, right? Now, uh, this time they're going to Ravenloft, the Realm of Terror. Uh, the actual book is called Dungeons and Dragons Shadow of the Vampires, graphic novel by, authored by Jim Zub with uh, Nelson Daniel and Max Dunbar on the illustrations. That's about 14 bucks paperback or 10 bucks for the Kindle version. Uh, I don't know what you would prefer, but I know I would rather have the paperback. Uh, we also have something really, really, really awesome. This is Realms of Arcania Star Trail release trailer. This is a faithful remake by Crafty Studios of, of course, the uh, Realms of Arcania sequel. Uh, if you haven't heard about this game before, it's, it's really awesome. You should definitely check it out. It's got uh, dozens of talents, spells, distinct classes, and races to choose from, uh, but most importantly, a challenging isometric turn-based combat system. Hell, 
Yes, I mean, check this thing out. It looks amazing. It's uh, $26.99 on Steam, so about $27. Bucks. Definitely worth your time. If you're a fan of the original series or you're just now hearing about it, go check it out. I think you'll really like what you see. All right, so uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about space travel, space exploration, all that good stuff. And I found a quote from one of my uh, personal heroes, uh, Mr. Carl Sagan. I love this guy. He's got some great books and stuff. But, but anyway, uh, here's the quote. We live in a society that's exquisitely dependent on science and technology, in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. <laughs> so ponder on that and see you guys next week. It's a big galaxy, Mr. Scott.